Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living at Home with Dementia. My name is Gail Snyder. I'm the Executive Director for Dementia Federal Fort Worth, and we are proud to offer this program with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and United Way. This is a recorded program, and if you do not wish to be record included in the recording, please mute your mic and keep your video off. And at this time, I'd like to introduce a brand new partnership with Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. And our guest presenter today is Nancy Strickland, and she to talk to us about painters and plays. Nancy, we're so glad to have you today. Thank you. Let me get my screen up now. All right, that worked. That worked. Um, I think we have one open mic on the other end. Uh, Patrick, it was you and I see that you fixed that now. So that's good. Thank you. It's nice to meet all of you. And this will be an interactive program. I'll be throwing some things out. I invite your comments and your questions. And um, I'd love to hear any personal connections you might have with what we're looking at, please interrupt me as we go. And I'm gonna move us right along. Painters in Place, we're focusing on how, where an artist lives, and really everything around them, how that um, has an, an impact on what they choose as their subjects for their art, or maybe even things that are going on in the world. I, you can, you've seen some of the things on television recently related to the, the COVID virus and the art that's coming out of that and also the um, Black Lives Matter movement and the art that's coming out of that. But we're going to go back in time a little bit. We're going to look at, oh, four or five different artists, places that they lived and how that might have impacted them. So let me see if I can move to the next slide. Okay, I'm not understanding why I can't do that. You should just be able to click on the screen. But I think you're shared. Yeah, I stopped the share to see if okay. I can hear. I think that I have people. Here we go. I'm just going to go. I'm sorry, people. I've done this lots of times. Here's our start. We're, we're, we're having a shortened program today. I'm just going to go right there from current slide and we'll see if it happens after this. So this is a Georgia O'Keeffe painting that's called Dark Mesa Pink Sky and it was painted in 1930. And you may know a little bit about Georgia O'Keeffe. She um, of course lived, she was born in Wisconsin and she lived a good part of her life in New York. And um, she first went to New, to New Mexico in the summer of 1929. And she saw it as such a huge contrast uh, to what she was used to. She was fascinated by these hills that had been worn down for year, uh, from years of wind and rain. And she was sort of attracted to the complexity of them. She, um, these are the hills that she was actually looking at. Uh, these were right around one of the places she eventually lived called Ghost Ranch. Have any of you ever visited um, New Mexico? Are you there? Yep, I have. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay because I lost your. I lost the image. Now I got everything going right. Okay. So yeah, I've never seen. I've been in New Mexico lots of times, but I've never seen these particular hills that are so. To me, they look like something from a volcanic eruption or, or something like that. And I guess that's possible. They do say wearing down, but looking back, she said it was the shapes of the hills that fascinated her, the red sand and the dark mesas behind them. It seems as though no matter how far you walked, you could still never get really into those hills. Now, do you think she painted them in a really realistic way? They do represent the hills. Yeah, they do. Can, yeah, they. Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. But then she, I, you know, she sort of takes all the components, and she did that with with a lot of the art that, or most all of the art that she did. And she was very um, on the forefront 
front of doing that, abstracting something real. Let's look at something else that she did. This is called Rancho's Church. This is in Taos, New Mexico. It's still there. It's about 500 years old. It was built by Spanish um, explore, not explorers, but the missionaries that came in. Uh, it's a few things for a church. What's it missing? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and a door. Uh, yeah, how are we going to get in? <laughs> Can't get in. We don't know much about this. And, you know, many, many artists went and painted in New Mexico, and many artists painted this church. George O'Keefe painted this church over and over again. And she, with the exception of one time, she always painted it from the back side. So we're looking at the backside, but she was much more interested in the color. What do you think about those beautiful muted colors? I love the way the sky sort of blends in then with the pink of the, oh, what's that called that they used to make? The stucco? No, adobe, adobe, yeah. Um, that, and that a building of course has to be patched frequently. And we'll see that in a, an additional picture, but. Here's a photograph of the back of that building. This was taken by a photographer named Paul Strand. This is in our collection too. And he was focusing on the shapes and the forms as much as um, you know, how it seems to rise out of the, the earth that it's in, but not really focusing on what we'd expect to see at a church. This is the front of the same church. This is the church. This picture, I'm not sure of the year of this picture. It's in our collection, but the church now has been repaired and, and, and is repaired more frequently. So you don't see this damage. It looks a little bit different now. But of course, we see the other accoutrements of a church, like the cross and the bells, and we see the way to get in. We still don't see a lot of windows, thick walls so that it's warm in the winter and cool in the summertime. New artist, and I'm kind of going through at a pretty fast pace. Um, this artist's name, the person that painted this name was Stuart Davis. And Stuart Davis was um, a, a, uh, on the forefront of the modernist movement, modern art, where, it's, where we're sort of changing to the more abstract. Um, this was painted, let me look at my notes here. This was painted in 1912. And actually, modern, modernist, modern, the modern movement started in Europe and it came to this country. There was this big art show in an old armory building in New York City. And it came to be known as the Armory Show. And people went to see all this very strange, abstract. There were a few things that were in the show. In fact, Stuart Davis had some work in the show. He started painting as a successful artist, dropped out of high school actually. His parents were both artists, so they let him drop out of high school and study with an artist. And um, he painted this uh, in, as I said, 1912. He was born in 1894, so he was still fairly young then. Uh, but the people that went to that show in this country, they're like, what in the heck is this abstract art? I see Jean and Patsy, you have some art behind you, don't you? I, I can see that. Um, so you must appreciate, yours looks a little more real, realistic. You have buildings there like we have in this one, but yours is a little more realistic than this one. This is a scene in New York. And one of the teachers that Stuart Davis had said, just go about the city and paint the everyday life. Paint what you're really, what you're really seeing. And it's not always pretty. What do you see about this? And you can unmute your microphones, everybody's, Pretty, oh, Jean, I see you and Joe have yours unmuted now. So what do you see uh, that's a little bit different about what's in your scene behind you? Are you talking to me? Yeah. It's actually of Ming Dynasty buildings, old Ming Dynasty buildings in China. In China. Wow. Wow. So you're probably looking at an urban scene too, though, aren't you? Yes. Okay, so we've got an urban scene here. Right. I can tell the shape that your buildings are in. Anybody else want to know the shape of these buildings? Do they look like they're in good repair? 
That's a... <laughs> not too bad, not too good. You no. know, it's not like a field of blue bonnets, though, is it? No. Oh. Or a beautiful mountain scene, or or something like that. So people didn't like this. Stuart Davis took up this idea of mo the more modern look, the more abstract. There was still something. Um, he was still basing it on something real and people weren't used to looking at things that weren't pretty you know they looked at in european art of course there was history and portraits and religious art and the beautiful uh, um, castles and all of those things and in this country the beautiful landscapes and now we're looking at something with trash cans we've got a cat up there on the rail not that cats aren't pretty we oh, got yeah. Who's dressed kind of in a usual unusual way? When children look at this, what do they, what do you think children think she is? Witch. A witch. Yes, she looks. She looks <laughs> a witch with that hat, and and um, she's got that white white face looking at us. Um, she's a woman walking maybe in the evening alone at night or in the evening in New York City. Proper thing for a proper woman to do. No. No. <laughs> She's um, really not a proper woman. Uh, people have speculated that that was the, the subject, part of the subject of this place. But then you do see those, that interesting use of color and such at the top that you'll see later. I want you to, I'm going to try to point right here. I want you to remember this. Swatch is a color like that because we're going to see this showing up at the very end of Stuart Davis's 50 year career as an artist, we're going to see something that looks similar to that. Did you notice the trash cans? Uh -huh. Any symbolism you might see with this kind of place and this kind of person and the trash cans? I sort of, you know, I'm thinking of like, this is not, this is not the upper crust. No. Not the, the thing that people value so much. Uh, and it's there by, by, and sometimes they're called ash cans. And to be, to tell you the rest of the story, the school of artists, or this, the group, a group of artists that are sort of painting in the same genre are sometimes called a school. So that school of artists came to be known as the ash can school. And probably when Stuart Davis painted this, he was aware that they were known. That might have been a little tongue in cheek for him to put the, the actual ash cans in his painting. Let's look at another one by Stuart Davis. Oh, yeah, this one. So Stuart Davis, the New Yorker, he travels, guess where? The Pacific. Oh, could have been the Pacific, but think about those buildings in the bottom as, it could have been that, as, as adobe. And think about that as desert. Yeah. And where did, where were all those artists going? Just like Georgia O'Keeffe. No, New Mexico. New Mexico. That's right. This is this is called New Mexican landscape. And Davis painted it in 1923. And to be honest, he did not love that landscape like Georgia O'Keeffe loved it. He um he didn't appreciate so much the beauty of it. It was almost like we know just from maybe words that are written and, and interviews that were done and so forth. And he was a premier American modernist painter, very well known. We, in fact, the museum has, uh, I believe, eight of his paintings in our collection, which is it's kind of unusual other than Russell and Remington. Um, we don't have that many of, of any other one painter, I don't believe. But anyway, so he goes and he's like, well, I got to go do my thing in New Mexico and I'll paint it. But it's so wide open. It's so different than what we're looking at, those Ming Dynasty um, buildings in, in a crowded city in China, or we're looking at, at New York City. We're out and all, it just goes on and on. So we've got, we've got, looks like this might be maybe some irrigated Maybe this is a little green patch, a little farm, adobe house. We've got the desert behind that. We've got the mountains. We have more mountains. And I know why you said Pacific, because lots of people that look at this, they're thinking water back there. Is that what you thought, Steve? Yep. Yep. You might think that that's water back there. 
Uh, and then the, the clouds there on the ground. But he didn't like it. So do you see anything in this painting that indicates that he tried to kind of close it in? What about you, Patrick? Do you see anything? I don't see Patrick there anymore. No, I see his name. Oh, okay. But he's oh. muted. Anybody else? Almost looks like you're looking at this painting in what format? 3D. Maybe 3D because it does go back some. It's, it's flat. Like a, like a photograph. Like a photograph maybe. And what is this gray and white business around the edges? Oh, yeah. The border. Yeah, border. He's, it's like he wanted to frame it in. I mean, this painting a real frame outside that but he painted a frame on it like maybe like close this in I'm I'm not used to this much open space I don't know that for sure now you're going to be very surprised at how he continued to progress the very last paintings that he did in his life and he was living in a very crowded crowded New York City again and this was in the 60s 1960 Three, 1964, and he died in 1964. So this is one of the last ones. And Stuart Davis came to think that anything was worthy of being put down on canvas and painted, which, you know, might seem like an unusual uh, thought for now, but for at the time he was living, and we, you remember we talked about like, people were used to seeing beautiful things and not, you know, and, and important things. But he's saying that anything is worthy of it. And in fact, in all this graffiti, I know this is very hard to read, but we know this because he wrote it down. So I'm not just making this up. This is the word any, A-N-Y. I know this is kind of the weird looking Y there, but that is the cursive any. Anything is worthy. He's living in a very crowded New York City. And this reminds me some of the graffiti that you would see in a crowded New York City. Can you make out any of the words there? Any of the other words? One says tight. Tight. By like the a tight place. Key. Yes. Keith the Pocky, maybe. I don't know. I'm, say that again, Patsy. Oh, it was me actually. Um, the, right beside the tight is a P, which may look like an A next to it, which may be for parking. Yes, that is what, I mean, that's what everybody thinks. It happens that it's funny because he's in the 60s. So think of that language we were using in the 60s. You know, like if something, what did they call a, a, a little apartment where just a whole bunch of people went and maybe crashed on the floor? Or a just pad. A pad. Oh, right. Who said that? Yeah. Joe, did you say that? <laughs> Joe, Joe is the hippie among us. <laughs> Joe, sure, on my age, that's right. <laughs> Okay, yeah, pad, and then tight, that was also part of that slang of that same time period. And then it's funny because this word down at the bottom, it says C-O-M-P-L, it's the word complete, but he didn't complete it. I'm not sure about that or why. And one of the reasons we know those words too is that he actually painted, this is a large painting in our collection. It's probably about six feet tall and maybe four, I'm gonna say seven feet tall, five feet wide, but it was, he had first painted this much, much larger. There was more to it. And the word complete was actually completely spread out. So he didn't like, I, I don't explain this right sometimes. So I, sometimes people misunderstand. He didn't like change that painting. That painting exists, it's in another museum, but he painted just a smaller portion of it at another time. And that's what we have here in our museum. I don't know what this guy is. Some people say it looks like Pac-Man or one of those game guys from a long time ago. <laughs> you, you guys probably are familiar with that. And this looks like a police whistle or a pipe or something to yeah, me. Yeah, I think a pipe, yeah. And, oh, and then, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, I thought the little character there may be a, a lion or something. Oh, this guy, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Um, but it's interesting, it does remind us city. So you can see over time how, this is just a brief look, and how his art really changed yeah. and became 
even more and more and more abstract than it was. Oh, I forgot to tell you the most important thing. This name of this painting is Blips and Ifs. Any military people among us? So thinking about, I think like aeronautics, radar, blips and ifs comes from that um, vernacular and blips are like the, the marks on the screen of a radar and I'm not a technical person and then the ifs that's intermittent frequencies of radar's impulses and I'm like, why would you call it that we could sit we could probably take another 30 minutes and think on that <laughs> Actually, the painting represents a lot of the style of graphic arts during that 60s. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, you know, and he was on the forefront of doing that. Yeah. And the blips and ifs, you think of like on a radar, everything is con it's changing constantly. You look at one thing and then it changes, changes, changes in a city. You know, you're looking out at a street scene in, in New York City. It's not going to look the same more than a second or a split second at a time with the cars going by and the people walking and stuff. So maybe it has something to do with those rapid changes. Okay, now this is another artist whose name is Marston Hartley. And he lived from the late, he lived 1877 to 1943. So he didn't live, by the way, Stuart Davis lived a, a pretty long life. Marston Hartley, though, this one is called, he lived in lots of different places. But when he painted this, he, when we're talking about how artists are influenced by what they're around, he was living in Provincetown, uh, Massachusetts. Provincetown, Massachusetts. Looking out his window, what do you think he might have, been, might have seen? That sailing ship. That's exactly right. He's looking at a boat. And it's so abstracted that just knowing the title can sort of help you. And it's, it's such a simple painting. This one's really small. I would say it's maybe 12 inches across and maybe 18 inches, not even that much, maybe 16 inches in height. It's very, very small. But the way he overlapped those cells, you get the idea of, of movement. You know, he's looking out in the water. It's a way that he created that sense of movement. I know this is not a fried egg, but did anybody think it looked like one? <laughs> Looks a little like a fried egg. I'm not sure what that is. Steve, you got you got to the ships right away. Any idea what this might reference on a boat? Uh, I don't know. It might be a boy in the water too. Oh, that's yeah, because the triangle on the bottom represents the boat waving back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a pivot point. A I don't point. know. I hadn't thought about that, but I'll keep that one. <laughs> this is that could be a, a, a paddle wheel on one of the steamships with the sails. Well, it certainly could, Patrick. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Patrick. Okay. It certainly could. It could. So now this is Carson Hartley, same artist, at one point in his life, he was given a grant by the Guggenheim Foundation, which is a very important um, foundation that supports artists and allows them to go and live and work and not have to worry about making money. And he went to Mexico for a year. If you were, if you were going to think of one word to describe this, what would that word be? What it is, but just anything that comes to mind. Solitude. Oh, okay. There's not a not another person there, or not any people there. I guess. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? De desolate. Desolate. Think about the colors. What would that make you think of? Evening shade. Evening shade. Well, I'm going to tell you what my four-year-old granddaughter said. She said, "Hot." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. And I thought that was good because we were like in the next gallery over and she pointed across and she says, hot. <laughs> that might have been, been it. This was like, um, 
an area where there has been volcanic activity. We're looking at the structure. And um, I, I think desolate evening shade, that beautiful color in the back. And um, what did Pat say? Something uh, desolate and, and, and being alone, I think. Solitude is Solitude, what Patrick said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Solitude. All right. Last one. So this, where do you think this guy lived that painted this? We're talking about painters in place. This is Charles D. He lived in the industrial city. He did. He lived in an industrial city, and this is called Chimney and Water Tower. And it's in Pennsylvania. I'm trying to think. It's not Pittsburgh. I'm not going to dwell on that. But it's an Armstrong manufacturing complex. It wasn't too far in Lancaster is where he lived. It wasn't too far from his childhood home. He was ill most of his life and did not live a long life. And actually, oh, I know he was an early diabetic. In fact, he was one of the first people. Um, he lived between 1883 and 1939, and he did have some experimental use of insulin um, in his life, but you know, still did not live a long life and wasn't healthy. But he painted what was around him. And I think he did a beautiful job of making an interesting painting out of, out of industrial. And we saw that as a, that was, uh, in, that was an, an important topic or subject of art as part of American art. That was something that was, the landscape art in America was sort of unique to America. And then also this during the industrial age and after this, it, uh, this kind of art as well. And this is called Chimney and Water Tower. And I love all the straight edges. In fact, uh, this is called Precisionism. And he used a pencil and he would draw it out. You can even see the, the pencil lines in the painting and draw out those straight lines and paint the straight lines, but then add just a little bit of a curve too uh, for interest there. And the last slide is comparing these two. So we see something uh, very hard edged at the top left um, the, the painting by Charles Demuth, and then we see those really soft lines, an organic building by George O'Keefe, kind of that contrast between those two things. So any comments or anything that you want me to go back because you didn't get to say something you wanted to say um, at, at a certain point, anything you want to look at again, questions? Really good, I like them. Good. And hopefully someday you'll get to come back to the Eamon Carter again and see the paintings there. So we're looking very to interesting. It's interesting to you. Uh, I'm glad that you enjoyed that. Um, we'll be doing this once a week. Uh, Aaron and uh, Peggy will be, uh, will rotate between Aaron and Peggy and myself. And I think I'm actually doing the next one too. And we're gonna talk a little bit about impressionist art next time. And um, have a you're on for the You're on for the 15th next. Okay, then I wouldn't be next. Aaron, yeah, be. Aaron, Aaron is next Friday the 10th. Okay, and then I'll be on the following Wednesday. So right. anyway, uh, and Aaron's will be very interesting. I think it's, you'll even be doing a little drawing activity with Aaron. So there's some things to, Nancy, I've never been to their museum, even though I live, lived in Fort Worth for a while. It's just, you know, you live someplace, you never go to visit places, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I haven't been, much I native, hardly been there when I went to work there. <laughs> <laughs> they have very much Native American art there or not? Um, that's a good question. The museum started with, I'll say this real quickly, the museum started with a... Um, with a collection of Western art by Charles Russell and Frederick Remington. Okay. So if you're talking about odd pictures that depict Native Americans, yes, particularly Russell's. And then, then other paintings too, as well. We have, you know, many artists that explored and traveled West and all of that. But as far as paintings by Native Americans or art by, very little. Mm -hmm. There are a few objects on the wall um, that, that, uh, happened to be the, uh, the artist happened to be of Native American heritage, but the subject matter is not necessarily related to their heritage. We, we have a we have a number of uh, paintings by Rex Moore, the Native American, and they're uh -huh. they're Indian scenes. Yeah. 
Right, okay. right. But he was a Native American. Uh, I actually met him. My father-in-law knew him. That's why we got the paintings, mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit of paintings, because my father-in-law worked with him. Uh, very well. I know there's some museum someplace that has a lot of his paintings. But I'm we don't know. We can't find out where it is now. You know, oh. kind of, it was online and then it disappeared. Type of thing, you know, type of thing. So, have you che have you checked the museums in Oklahoma? We did, and I, we thought at one time there was one that had some, but then it kind of disappeared as far as listings. Mm -hmm. But we're not sure. <laughs> uh, he is from from uh, Montana, the Dakotas area, but very well known, <laughs> very well respected. Native American artist. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly he did a lot of um, uh, oil paints, but like for our wedding, he gave us a uh, ink drawing portrait that he did for a wedding present. Oh, that was him. nice. And tell me his name again, Rex? Moore. Moore, that's why, okay. Moore, well, R-R-E. -R I'll look into that, maybe I'll find -R -E. something. Yeah. Okay. Um, Quite a history right. in there if you look at yeah. it. Anyway, so thank you. Yes, oh, you're welcome. Thank you, yeah. You're welcome. All right. Is the, is the museum open at all now? Yes, the museum opened about, I'm going to say about three weeks ago. It's very slow. Oh, yesterday afternoon when I was leaving about four o'clock, I asked at the desk, there were five people in the museum because um, people are just afraid, you know, to get out. And I guess they're just thinking about the things and we're not doing any of our special programming. And what are its hours? Lots, the hours are 10 o'clock to five o'clock, um, Monday through Friday. And we stay open at eight o'clock on Thursday. So on Thursday it's eight. And then on Sundays we're open from 12 to, um, five o'clock. But let me tell you this too, on online, there, there are some really fun, and, and I'll, I'll say this uh, specifically to, to you, is it Terry, Aaron? I've forgotten, Aaron. No, the person in charge. Gail. Gail, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, I worked with an, a, a recently with a, an organization called the Senior Learning Network, and um, she had pushed out to people that were doing these online things with her. Um, she had pushed out um, information from the Eamon Carter to them about our, about something really fun. And anybody can go to it um, by looking at um, Facebook and Instagram and that sort of thing. And I think you can get them through our website too. It's called Cooped Up with the Carter. So it's some yes, I saw some of those. Okay, it's about eight, they're about eight minutes long, and it's just a fun. You you talk about one work of art, and then there's some sort of activity demonstrated after that. But there really are very fun. Some of them funny um, to watch. So you might be interested in cooped up, cooped up with the Carter. And you also might be interested, Gail, in um, looking into the Senior Learning Network and. I don't think it costs anything for people to participate, but I'm not really sure. But um, th they host programs like this, some from art museums, some from, some from other things, and it's all for, it's for seniors. And I did one recently and there were maybe 25 people that were connected from all over the country. So that might be, if, especially with your group like this, that's that's uh, tech savvy and has gotten interested in this and may want to take it a little further and, and, ex and explore a little farther out. Those are great ideas, Nancy. Thank you. Ah, you're welcome. Okay. I'm gonna, now I'm going to teach by Zoom my six-year-old granddaughter to read. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nancy. It was well, so you. great to have you with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Tomorrow, we will have our weekly The Price is Right game. So join us tomorrow at 1030 if you're available. Um, it's a fun game, and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. I hope you've enjoyed uh, our Eamon Carter presentation today and look forward to the next one of those on Friday, July the 10th.